This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to take a deeper look at revelation that that is all around us. And by that, I mean not only the supernatural revelation of God's Word, for example, such as in the book of Revelation, the the last book in the Bible. And you cannot understand the Bible, by the way as most of you know. You cannot understand the Bible at all. It makes It's meaningless. It's like a, a crazy abstract painting if you don't read and study the book of Revelation. You have to read Genesis to Revelation to get it. If you don't read Genesis to Revelation, you may have gotten an important part, but you certainly haven't gotten it. You didn't get the message. I mean, it's God's Word, and God's Word is exactly that. It's the Word of God. It's holy. It's sacred. It's inspired. It's inerrant. It's without error. Now think about that, because none of mankind's books are without error. So because of the fact that the Bible is without error, it means it's truth, and that's why it's so powerful, and that's why it's opposed so uh, aggressively. You know, if the Bible was just a joke, like some of its critics try to portray the Bible as being just a joke, um, nobody would bother criticizing or attacking it or making fun of it or attacking uh, those people that follow the Bible, um, specifically Christians and Jews who follow the Uh, Old Testament. Nobody would criticize those groups if the Bible didn't have something very powerful to say. If it was just a joke, like like the critics try to make it look like, then they would leave it alone. The fact that they go to such incredible lengths to attack the Bible proves Uh, the reliability and truthfulness of the Bible. It's like Bertrand Russell, one of the founders of the globalist elite, if you want to call him that, and you could call him that. He's dead now. Um, He was around in the days of Alice Huxley, Julian Huxley, H.G. Wells, and all the rest of these members of the globalist elite who planned for this global uh, order. And and, and one of uh, Bertrand Russell was very famous in Britain and the United States because, uh, in addition to being an intellectual and a thinker and a globalist, he was also a militant and evangelistic atheist. So he he wrote a book called "Why You Know Why Why He Didn't Believe in God or Christianity," uh, as as a number of atheists have. Why would you go to all that trouble to disprove something that that you consider so completely irrelevant and 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 nuts? Why would you go to the trouble to to write a book to disprove it? It would disprove itself. I mean, if it really was a bunch of nonsense, which you're, is what you're saying it is, then if you simply stopped talking about it and walked away from it, it would die uh, of its own accord. But no, you see, these, these people are like addicted to, to attacking believers, to attacking the Bible, etc. And the reason they're addicted to it is because what's really going on deep down inside, in the, in the core of their personality, in the core of their being, is a massive conflict between truth and error. Because deep down inside, they know They know that the Bible is true, and they know that it's God's Word. Because the law of God has been written on their hearts. Whether they like it or not, the law of God has been written on their hearts. Now, they can choose to override that law. They can choose to suppress it, deny it, say it isn't there. But that requires a lot of effort and work. And maybe that's why so many atheists spend so much time uh, not not really talking about atheism. They spend most of their time attacking Christianity 
primarily Christianity and the Bible. In any case, the point is this, that as we look at what's happening in our world today, there is a revelation going on. And yes, there's a supernatural revelation of the last days, uh, talked about in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. But there's also what's happening on the global level, the cultural level, the economic level, the scientific level, and every level that mankind operates on is in a state of chaos and turmoil right now. I was doing an interview on a national uh, radio show, which I posted for you to uh, listen to if you went to paulmcguire.us. And uh, the audience is primarily secular. And I got a lot of calls from uh, people. Uh, the interview was like an hour and a half, something like that. And then the callers came in. And it was interesting because this, again, it was, it's primarily uh, a secular format. But uh, many of the people called, uh, a fair number of them were people who were formerly Christians. They were raised in Christian households. And uh, when they got older, some of these people were in their 60s, etc., they, they had... I guess, rejected their faith or walked away from their Christian faith. And they called into me to talk to me. And I, I was the guest of the show, not the host of the show, because they could relate to me. Now, um, because I, I started out in the program talking about the fact that I was raised as an atheist and I hated Christianity. And then I uh, talked about uh, things that happened in my life, and how uh, I realized that I had been biased uh, in my examination of Christianity and the Bible, that that my research and that my perception was flawed because of the internal bias that I had. And then I talked about the fact that I had a miraculous encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, these people called up because they could relate to me, even though their stories, in many cases, were the opposite of, of mine. They were raised in Christian homes, and they, and they walked away from those, that, that you know, uh, religious upbringing. So the reason they related to me is because uh, I've worked on that. You know, I'm talking about for decades and decades. I've worked on uh, teaching myself and teaching others how to effectively communicate with people, so you don't you don't have these walls, these uh, unnecessary walls, which gets in the way of communication. By the way, as you as we all know, so it was an interesting. Uh, I've been on the show. I don't know, maybe seven times, six times. I can't remember the exact number over a, a period of years. And the reason the audience opened up to me in the way that they did is because I, I didn't, I wasn't there trying to lay a trip on their heads. I wasn't trying to manipulate them. And they, and they could tell that and they could sense that. And I, I did add the comment, a comment I've made on this program many times, which is I believe the vast number of people who are so-called rejecting Christianity, so-called rejecting uh, Jesus Christ. I don't think that the vast majority of people who, who are rejecting Christianity, uh, I don't think they're rejecting Jesus Christ. I think the problem is they're rejecting what could be called this, this uh, prevalent cultural interpretation of what it means to be a Christian versus rejecting an authentic biblical interpretation of what it means to be a Christian. And by that I mean there's a difference between being a Christian 
in the mold and the manner that Jesus Christ described and the Bible describes versus being a Christian in the mold and manner that contemporary Christians have invented and popularized. Now, I'm not just trying to, 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 to you know, attack the wind here and, and just take pot shots at groups just for the sake of, of you know, whatever. But you, you take things like the emergent church and a lot of the evangelical church, not all of it, uh, the seeker-friendly movement, etc., and many other Christian movements. Um, those are largely based on the interpretation of, you know, a select few uh, men or women who have interpreted Christianity with their finite human minds, and they've come up with their own human-centered or man-centered or woman-centered or whatever you want to call it, uh, interpretation of Christianity. And so what people are rejecting, in my opinion, is not true Christianity as the Bible communicates or as Jesus Christ communicated. What they're really rejecting is this counterfeit, cultural, man-made interpretation of the Christian religion. And that is, this counterfeit, and not, and not all of it, by the way, there's, there are truthful segments of Christianity all over the place, all over the world, all over the United States. But in addition to the truthful segments of Christianity, there are what I would call uh, counterfeits, whether they're intentional or not. You know, that's a case-by-case basis. But the point is, these people that I talk to on on a national secular program, and I've done many national secular programs on TV and radio, and oftentimes I'll talk to, to people either live on air or off the air or whatever. Most of the time it's live on air. People open up and talk. And I always hear the same thing. And what I hear, because I, I train myself to listen very carefully, what I hear is them rejecting this, this cultural Christianity that they were indoctrinated in. And, and it's, it's not so much that they're rejecting Christ or the Bible. It's more a matter of that they're rejecting this man-made interpretation, which passes for or functions as a substitute for the real thing, the, the genuine thing, which is biblical Christianity. And that's the purpose of, of this ministry and this program, the Paul McGuire Report in Paradise Mountain Church is to evangelize. But what does evangelize mean? Well, evangelize means effectively communicating, effectively reaching people with the truth of the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're effective in your communication, it doesn't mean you're going to win everybody. But it does mean you will increase the percentage significantly of people that you do win to Jesus Christ or win back to Jesus Christ. Now, when I say win back to Jesus Christ, I'm not implying <clears throat> that you can lose your salvation because I don't believe the Bible teaches that you can lose your salvation. If that were true, we would have all lost our salvation along the way. I, I don't believe you could lose your salvation, assuming that you were genuinely saved and genuinely born again to begin with. But the the critical thing here is that we have people all over the the United States, all over the world, there are people listening to this program, Paul McGuire Report, all, all over the world, in many different nations. When we, as part of our game plan to to protect ourselves from extinction, and and you can read between the lines on that. Um, We diversified the number of media 
outlets that were on, especially in, in some critical areas, so we wouldn't disappear. If you know what I mean. And and in the process of doing that, uh, we ended up reaching a a significantly larger percentage of people in places like the European Union, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and many other places. Our numbers of, of listeners and watchers picked up in those areas. And people all around the world, Europe, Great Britain, the USA, all over the world, are experiencing uh, because we do live in what Marshall McLuhan called a global village because of media, uh, people are experiencing simultaneously all kinds of chaos and social disruption that's been escalating you know, for the past 50 or 60 years very intensively, a very intensive escalation. And so the questions that I was asked towards the end of the program had to do with this question, which was, you know, are we, are we really living in the last days at this particular time? Or hasn't this kind of thing happened before? Now, I'm sure many of you have been asked that question. I ask that question all the time. <clears throat> and I simply answer by saying, that for a number of reasons, I believe that the time period that we're in now is uh, significant, significantly different than previous time periods. And then I'll name some uh, reasons for that, such as the increase of freak weather and earthquakes and famines and wars and rumors of wars. and. Uh, the signs of the times that Jesus Christ spoke about, you know, when, when the love of many will, will grow cold, and then all kinds of other prophetic signs that have occurred. And then callers called in to add prophetic signs. Some were obviously apparently Christians, and some perhaps weren't, but they were familiar with the signs of the times. So. You got two two streams of historical pro, uh, progression going on. On on one hand, you have this falling away or apostasy, great apostasy, this great falling away from the truth of the Bible. That that's happening when you have the escalation and rise of counter, counterfeit Christian expressions. And counterfeit Christianity, when you have the exponential rise of counterfeit Christianity, and then simultaneously you see statistical evidence from reputable pollsters regarding uh, the fastest growing religion in America being number one, Wicca or witchcraft, tied in number one position for the fastest growing religion. Is also atheism. So you have this 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 weird spiritual belief system. It's what it is. It's witchcraft plus Wicca plus atheism, which actually doesn't logically make sense. But forget about the logic for a moment. That belief system is the fastest growing religion in America. That also concurs with all the data that I've shared with you on the Paul McGuire report regarding, uh, you know, eight out of ten kids from e evangelical homes will walk away from their faith in Jesus Christ by the time <clears throat> they, they either enter college or their college age, they've reached college age. Eight out of ten kids from evangelical homes will have walked away from their faith. Now, I think it would be a very tragic and sad mistake for those of you that are Christian parents and um, have experienced this in one way or another, to simply say, oh, gee, it's all my fault. I don't think it's all your fault. 
Um, I think you have to understand what's going on on a deeper level. The Christian faith, a Judeo-Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, Christianity, um, a belief in the Bible, and, and the, the tragedy is that so many of these churches don't ask me what they teach the people because I have no idea why you would deprive the people of of knowledge, which is power, so they can become victorious, including their parenting, is beyond me. But the point is that you you have to look at the data. <clears throat> and the information regarding uh, witchcraft being the fastest growing religion and Wicca tied with atheism. You have to look at that very deeply, not superficially. You have to also look at the fact that uh, atheism is tied for the number one place for fastest growing religion. And that 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes are rejecting their faith in Christ or walking away from Christianity by the time they enter college or enter the college age range. If you look at that on a deeper level, what you discover is this, and this is in the books that I've written, not just one. I don't think there's been a book written that that, that I've written that has. Uh, neglected to discuss this topic at some point because it's so important. I mean, even if you're only dealing with it in a couple of pages, it's it's vitally important. And this is what's important. You have to understand, as many of you do, unfortunately, many of the people you know and I know don't know anything about this. You have to understand a, a, a series of facts, historical facts. And that is that biblical Christianity, Christian values, Christianity itself, the teachings of Jesus Christ, the teachings of the Bible, a Judeo Christian worldview, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the entire Bible, has been under a highly focused, strategic, long-term planning involved attack for the last easily 75 years. But really, the escalation of this strategic attack against the Christian faith and the Bible has been going on long before 75 years ago. It goes back a long time before that. But it really began to ramp up in the early 1900s. And it has accelerated uh, faster and faster. So the point is that this decline of uh, people becoming Christians in America and other places, and that would include Europe and Great Britain, um, this decline among people becoming Christians and young people becoming Christians, this so-called decline of Christianity, this so-called waves of young people walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ, all of that is not exactly what it is pretending to be. It's pretending to be like, like a random set of Uh, occurrences where because of the ebb and flow of various cultural and social and sexual tides of human behavior, the the so-called experts, so-called, will say, well, you know, society, quote, is evolving, which is ridiculous. Uh, Society is not evolving. We're more savage today than they were a thousand years ago. We may have technology and science, but we have turned technology and science in in many places into expressions of savagery and brutality, etc. So 
the, the key thing here is that there's no, quote, evolution of society that's randomly causing these riptides of change where people are leaving Christianity or leaving true Christianity and becoming uh, practicing witches or Wiccans or atheists or whatever. That's not what's playing out before our eyes. So if you see it like that, you're, you're making a fatal miscalculation. And fatal miscalculations usually end in disaster. If you understand history, and that's why I wrote my book, uh, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, because it summarizes in a fast-moving way some of the things that I'm going to address here. Um, and that is that we all know, or we, we used to all know in America, we used to all know uh, a lot about our founding fathers, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, the, the birth of America. That used to be, you know, like basics in every school system in the nation. But we've been through several decades, well, more than several, we've been through, it, what, <clears throat> at least six decades or more. That's 60 years or more. We've been through decades of, not education, but decades of social engineering, dumbing the population down. And in order to do that, you have to remove or eradicate all kinds of teaching from the school systems. And that means you specifically remove the historical teachings, the teachings on how to use your analytical abilities, your, your knowledge of history, etc., in order to understand things from facts, not from fantasy. So we've gone through this 60-year period minimum of scientific dumbing down, of uh, indoctrination, you want to use the word mind control, that would not be uh, an unfair word to use. <clears throat> Hypnotic type teaching, and so on and so forth. So you have a massive population pool of countless millions of people in the USA, in Europe, European Union, Great Britain, etc. You have a massive global and national population pool consisting of many millions of people who have gone through the dumbing down process. And, and it's more intensive than just a generalized dumbing down process. It's also a propaganda embedding process and a hypnotic programming process. So what, what happens? What's the end result of that? of that uh, combination, that toxic mixture uh, being uh, consumed by students who don't even know what they're, they're ingesting or consuming. What's the byproduct? Well, we're going to expose that in just a moment on the Paul McGuire Report. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Take advantage of our book bundle discounts and save money on the books that I've mentioned and other books. Uh, and remember, knowledge is power. So visit paulmcguire.us and enjoy all the hundreds of free articles, the free access to the Paul McGuire Report archives, the free Roku channel with a, at least 100 hours or more of Bible prophecy teaching and uh, from me at Paradise Mountain Church and conferences, etc. So visit paulmcguire.us, and we'll be back in just a moment. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. You were created, literally, for such a time as this. So here you are in this time zone, in this lifetime, 
living in whatever nation you happen to live in, or whatever state or province you ha- happen to live in. None of it is by accident. You're here by design, by, by a divine plan. And therefore, your life has purpose, and your life has a destiny to be fulfilled. It doesn't matter what you feel like at this particular moment. You may feel incredible at this particular moment. You may feel horrible at this particular moment. How you feel, though, is irrelevant. Because how you feel has nothing to do with the fact that your life has purpose or destiny. Your life has purpose and destiny because God ordained that before the beginning uh, of time, before he uh, founded and created the world. He, He planned for you to be here, and he equipped you right down to everything that's programmed into your DNA. You know, I don't want to get on the side side thing there, but this whole thing about evolution. If you were to really actually use your God-given intelligence and analyze evolution, it's the biggest farce. It's the biggest, it's, it's, it's a, like a bad joke that never goes away. The double helix, DNA, your genetic code. Okay, we all know that, that that's what uh, causes a lot of the things in our body soul and spirit to operate, or at least the the physical part of our being. But the point is that if we were really evolved from animals or inanimate objects going back 200 million years ago, there would be, if that was true, if it was even remotely true, there would be evidence in our uh, DNA, there would be all kinds of signatures and history in our DNA that would prove that theory. But there is none. <laughs> and therefore, the theory is false. It's not true. It's, it's, just, it's just a little fairy tale made up by, by a, a, a bunch of guys, literally. The elite, like like the Huxley family and the Bertrand Russell and the, the other members of this globalist elite group, they promoted this theory because they 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 had in mind they they are the same people and organizations and money that were behind the attack against Christianity, against Christian values, and against the Bible that began take, taking off in the early 1900s. <clears throat> they financed it, they planned it, they launched it. Why would they do that, people ask? Because their bottom line philosophical foundation is that they have an antichrist theology, an antichrist belief system, a Luciferian belief system. Now, people can't handle that. It's just too much for them to handle. Well, it happens to agree with what the Bible has to say. The Bible talks about all kinds of things regarding <clears throat> Mystery Babylon and the nature and composition of Mystery Babylon and how Mystery Babylon returns in the last days. And the Bible talks about Lucifer and the fallen angels, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. All of that is talked about in the Bible, and especially in the book of Revelation. But these groups, by the way, these groups of individuals were linked and are linked to very powerful occult secret societies with names like the Illuminati and uh, many other occult secret societies because they couldn't openly announce their Luciferian plan, but they've hid it in plain sight. I mean, if you really want to know 
you can do research and find this out for yourself. The problem is most people don't really want to know. They don't really want to do any research. And therefore, they're content to give over their minds to somebody else to control for their entire lives. It's rather sad, don't you think? Okay, so here's, here's the point. A literal invasion has been occurring. And what has been invaded is uh, areas that Christianity and the Bible used to influence, especially in people's lives. So you've seen massive social transformation on all levels, but what's agitating that massive social transformation is the hidden influence, the hidden persuasion of deeply financed, highly strategic planning that has been implemented to radically transform our culture. To And, and now here's where they actually come out and say it. You read the, the, the writings of Willis Harmon, who was associated with the Stanford Research Institute. They were big on all kinds of mind control experimentation, LSD experimentation. And Willis Harmon uh, operated out of the Stanford Research Institute. And his thing was um, moving America, moving American churches, American society, American businesses, moving them all away from a biblical culture and moving them into a pagan, tribalistic, occult, uh, and again, pagan culture. And he even lectured uh, in the very early 70s, I think the exact year was 1970 or 1971, Willis Harmon lectured some of the, the biggest name leading evangelical thinkers, and, and they invited Willis Harmon to speak, if I don't ask me why, to lecture them, and he basically lectured the leading evangelical thinkers into experimenting with, you know, astral projection, uh, ESP, all kinds of occult-based practices. But he didn't do it by himself. This was part of a global plan that was set up. So here we are today, decades later, and you see that the seeds that people like Willis Harmon and many others <coughs> planted, uh, those seeds have come to life. <coughs> and so you have entire new, quote, evangelical Christian movements that are based in some ways, more upon the teachings, the New Age teachings of like a Willis Harmon from Stanford than they are based or founded upon a, a biblical worldview. That's where we are now. So the apostasy that we see around us is not an accident. It was planned. Okay, so the question is, where do we go from here? What do we do about this? And what do we do about the fact that we live in the last days? Well, let's just start with that. We don't do anything with the fact that we live in the last days. We live in the last days. You accept it. You live in the last days. Accept it. Now, <clears throat> you should accept it, but there's a difference between accepting the theological belief based on Scripture that we're living in the last days there's a difference between that and doing a counterfeit of that, which would be to become apathetic or to just become paralyzed by circumstances, immobilized by the circumstances. Those are two different things. We live in the last days, but Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. And Jesus Christ is Lord, period. 
So if we were not living in the last days, <clears throat> Jesus Christ would still be Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord if we are living in the last days, and I believe that we are. So Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, no matter where you're living uh, <clears throat> chronologically. So you're living in the last days, Jesus is still Lord. Jesus still has a plan for your life. And if you really look at it, Jesus had a plan for your life specifically, which he created and gave to you before he created or founded this, this world. So Jesus planned for you to be living in the last days before he founded and created this world. So it's not an accident that you're living here in the last days. It's by God's design. It's by God's providence that you're living here in the last days. And that means that you can know with a certainty that God has a plan for your life and for you in the last days. The fact that you're in the last days doesn't interrupt God's plan for your life. The fact that you're in the last days actually, if you look at it biblically, releases God's plan for your life. So, you shouldn't be caught up in the confusion, the, the paralysis, the, the chaos that so many people are caught up in. Because you were created to be here for such a time as this. And you were specifically equipped by God with all the supernatural talents, abilities, and giftings that you need to accomplish um, your mission that was assigned to you by God before the foundation of the world. Now that's intense. Okay, so what God expects and what God wants is simply this. He wants each one of us, that's you, that's me, that's all people who, who claim to be believers in Jesus Christ, he wants us to live by faith in him. Everything we need for life, for accomplishing our mission, for accomplishing our destiny, for accomplishing God's plan for our lives, everything that we need can be secured or acquired by placing our faith in the promises of God and his word and then acting on the promises of God and his word. And when we do those two things, we release the power of God and God's supernatural provision to flow through our lives. And that means, at that moment, we receive that supernatural energizing force of the Holy Spirit which is the dunamis, which comes from the word dynamite, the dynamite power of God. It's an explosive force of power of the Spirit of God. And any true Christian should be clothed with power from on high. If you're not clothed with power from on high, then you're essentially naked in the eyes of God. Now, that's a deep truth right there. And let's put our finger on that for just a moment. Let's look at what God is trying to communicate to us when he tells us in his word that we are to be clothed with power from on high. Let's look at where that came from in the word of God and discover uh, a dynamic principle that can release the destiny of not only our lives, but our children's lives, and it can potentially release the destiny of any nation, any state, any community. The destiny can be released if there's a significant percentage of people that are living their lives by faith in the supernatural power of God.
You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. We'll be back in just a moment. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. This is Paul McGuire. Okay. In the book of Genesis, which is about the beginning of everything God created, um, in the book of Genesis, we read what happened to Adam and Eve when they chose to disobey God and eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, because they were tempted by the serpent of old, who was really Satan or Lucifer, embodied in a serpent being. And instead of listening to God and God's word, they listened to the lies and the psychological manipulation of of the devil, serpent of old. Okay, so after they had disobeyed God, they activated the death force, they activated the law of sin and death. And remember, just seconds before they disobeyed God and ate of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, immediately before that, they had the supernatural power to rule and reign over planet Earth, to rule and reign over the Garden of Eden, and to exercise dominion over the Garden of Eden and planet Earth. They had the supernatural authority to rule and reign supernaturally planet Earth and the Garden of Eden. Okay? That's that's powerful. But then they activate the law of sin and death. And because they disobeyed God's word. So what happens? What is the visible manifestation of um, their disobedience? Well, theologically, it's called the fall of man, the fall of mankind. Mankind, Adam and Eve, fell from its exalted state as the man and woman who ruled and reigned planet Earth and exercised dominion over it, mankind, Adam and Eve, fell from that high position to a very inferior and and far lower position. That's why it's called the fall of man. Their disobedience caused the fall of mankind to occur. So how does this show up physically or visually? So we can recognize it. Well, we read in Genesis chapter 3, immediately after Adam and Eve yielded to temptation and ate of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, she also, that's Eve, gave to her husband that's Adam, with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, this is like so profound. This is so mind-blowing. These couple of verses, and we'll read a few more, but this is so mind-blowing. Because it applies to your world and my world today, and it applies to understanding God's supernatural law regarding how you and I can be clothed with power from on high and live supernaturally. Not unrealistically, but supernaturally. Okay, so what happens? was that immediately after they ate of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, all of a sudden, uh, their eyes are supernaturally opened. And all of a sudden, for the first time in their lives, they knew that they were naked. So they, they felt ashamed. They felt embarrassed. 
They knew that they were naked. They never had those series of emotions before. It's like, you know, and I mean this in, in total innocence. It's rather sad that I even have to uh, uh, support what I'm about to say with that disclaimer. But our world has become so corrupted that a, that a, a, a disclaimer, I believe, is necessary. Little children, just naturally, when they're very young, are innocent of whether they're naked or clothed or whatever. So if a child loses their diaper or whatever, they're not embarrassed. They may be, you know, want to have their diaper changed, but they're, they don't have any range of emotions that, that reflects embarrassment or shame or even the knowledge that they're naked. They're in a state of somewhat innocence, at least in contrast with adults. Well, that's kind of the state that Adam and Eve were in. Uh, to a large degree, they they were in a state of mind, a state of being that they didn't even have any awareness that they were naked. And so they weren't ashamed, they weren't embarrassed ever. But after, immediately after they eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, then they're like they look at their world and themselves with with new eyes. And all of a sudden, they're shocked and, and horrified and embarrassed and ashamed they're naked. And that, that intensity of the shame is so intense that they do what they can, however feeble, to try to cover up their nakedness. So, so they actually uh, make like a makeshift garment and, and, and made out of fig leaves. To, to hide their private parts. I don't know how else to put it. So, so they were trying to cover up their nakedness. They weren't cold. They were trying to cover up their nakedness because the first time in their life they were ashamed. And that's exactly what this scripture verse says. Then the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, picking up again in verse 8, Let's read what happens. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent. So then, as you continue on, he curses the serpent. God does. And God um, essentially curses Adam and Eve for what they've done. He he also plans uh, to deliver them. God's love for Adam and Eve is so great that even in this passage in Genesis, where you see that Adam and Eve activate the law of sin and death, you see, even in that activation of the law of sin and death, you see God and his love reaching out to them while they're ashamed and naked and humiliated, and they've activated the death force. God's, you know, he doesn't zap them with a lightning bolt. Notice that God covers their nakedness with animal skins. Now, why does that happen? Why does that happen? Why does God do this? Okay, let's read where we, where we can uh, see this. Uh, in, again, in Genesis chapter 3, <clears throat> starting this time at verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. 
also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Wow. Why did God make clothing out of animal skin for them? Why did he do that? Because God knew that they now knew that they were naked and they were ashamed and afraid, etc. And this, what is God's trying to say to you and I in this passage of Scripture, that even when we come to him in our lives, when we come to God in our lives, naked, so to speak, ashamed, guilty, or whatever it is that would cause us to be afraid and ashamed and embarrassed before God. And not one of us, not one of us has not experienced that on many levels, no matter how long you've been alive. We've all experienced that. Why? Because we're all fallen creatures, and we have all experienced the repercussion of the fall of mankind. Not one of us is exempt. So what God is showing us is that his love for Adam and Eve remained even when they totally failed. And in the same way, God's personal love for you, God's personal acceptance for you, God's personal forgiveness and belief in you remains true no matter whether or not you failed or sinned or you're guilty and should be ashamed, whatever it is or whatever the things are that make you feel ashamed and afraid and embarrassed to come before God, God wants you to remember his truth, which he, he's playing out before us now in the account of Adam and Eve, that even in Adam and Eve's desperation and humiliation, God comes to them. And in love, he doesn't beat them. God clothes their nakedness. He takes away their shame by clothing their nakedness with animal skins. So they're no longer naked. They're they're now clothed, except they're clothed with God. Now, you should ask the question, well, didn't they clothe themselves? Wasn't that good enough? Because they did make clothing for themselves. They tried to cover their nakedness by using uh, fig leaves. Wasn't that good enough? <clears throat> and excuse me, the answer is no, it wasn't good enough. And right here we, we, we go to a plumb line of deep, deep biblical truth. This is the kind of deep biblical truth that is bankrupt from our churches, our seminaries, and many of our Christian ministries. Not all, but a significant percentage. I would say the overwhelmingly larger percentage of Christian institutions, including the church, have been corrupted by this world system so that the truth is so diluted that it lacks power. But the truth is supposed to, it's intended to, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So what is God saying here? God is saying something profound. And when you grasp it through the revelation of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, when you review his word, and it's anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, the chains and the shackles on your life will will break, and you will be set free. And in that freedom, you will receive power, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit from on high. That's how revival starts. A knowledge of the Word of God, a deep knowledge of the Word of God, and an openness by faith to the move of the genuine Spirit of God. So here we are looking at Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve knew that they were naked and they tried to cover up their nakedness by using fig leaves, that God is telling us that story because that is a classic example of works of the flesh. Adam and Eve, instead of going to God and repenting and admitting their sin before God, so what, what God would have wanted them to do was the second after, or immediately after they had sinned, 
God would have preferred they simply called on his name. God, we blew it. We, we did what you told us not to do. We ate of that fruit in the middle of the garden. God, forgive us, help us. We, we have broken your commandment. If Adam and Eve had done that, God would have moved instantaneously to forgive them. But instead of confessing their sin before their Lord, they, they hide it. They hid their sin. And because they hid the, their sin, that was their method, their in, initial method of covering up their sin was to hide it. How did they hide it? They gathered the works of their garden, their, their, their own flesh work, their own hard work. They gathered the fig leaves from their garden, most likely the Garden of Eden, and they covered their nakedness up. They tried to hide their nakedness by covering their private parts, etc., with fig leaves. But you see, that's the classic example of, of the self trying to be the savior, of man trying to save himself or herself. It doesn't work. Because fig leaf or no fig leaf, they had activated the law of sin and death, which meant that they were now in the process of degrading, in the process of dying, and after a relatively short period of time, you know, a couple of hundred years or more, uh, <clears throat> they would physically die. And, and the, the fig leaf is not going to save them from physically dying. They were cursed by the law of sin and death. So God in his love demonstrates to them how only he can save them. And he initially does this by using animal skins. But there's a, there's a message in the animal skin. What the message of the animal skin covering is that to get the animal skin, there has to be the shedding of blood. In this case, the shedding of animal blood is the only way you can skin an animal to use it to make clothing to cover the nakedness of people, the only way you can do that is by taking the life of the animal. No, God's not cruel and God doesn't hate animals. You say, why? Because God says further on in his word that without the spilling of blood, there can be no remission of sins or sin. In other words, according to God's own law, the only way to undo the power of the death force or the law of sin and death or sin, the only way to undo that is not through some man-made work like covering your nakedness with fig leaves. The only way to undo that is by applying the blood to take away or to remove the sins. So God takes the blood of animals to give Adam and Eve the, the skin, animal skin covering they need to cover their nakedness. But God, God is now illustrating for them that deeper, deeper, powerful spiritual truth. But it goes even deeper than that. In order for Adam and Eve to walk in complete deliverance from the law of sin and death. They have to not only trust God to clothe them, they're now going to be brought into a position where they're going to have to have faith or trust God for their salvation, for their deliverance, because they have a destiny with death. They were created initially to live eternally. Now they have a destiny with death. They're mortal. They're in the process of dying. The only person that can save them is not themselves. Fig leaves, you know, uh, uh, eating organic food, nutrition, that's all great. You know, that's fine. 
but it's not going to save you from death. Only God can save you from death. Transhumanism can't save you from death. I was doing this interview the other day, last night, <clears throat> on the secular program I referred to, and I talked about when I was a kid, I, was, I wanted to be a scientist. And I was always an out-of-the-box thinker. So what I did for my, my junior high school science fair project was I did an amateur experiment in chirogenics. And chirogenics was the, the brand new science back then where people would freeze their bodies, wealthy people, in the hopes that in the future when technology and science had advanced enough, their, their bodies and brains could be defawed and brought back to life. And so the, the science of chirogenics was born. Well, what I did is I took a healthy green plant. I got a hypodermic needle. <clears throat> I injected the healthy green plant with the hypodermic needle that was filled with alcohol. And then I froze the healthy green plant in the freezer of, of my childhood home. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sure my mother loved that. And uh, also I put the healthy green plant in a container, but it was frozen in the freezer for a couple of months. <clears throat> and then I brought it back to life by dethawing it naturally in sunlight. And, you know, I had to photograph each phase of the experiment, and label it, and write down the scientific principles, and show the hypodermic needle and pictures of the green plant, you know, how the science fair things go. Well, what happened to my healthy green plant is that when I dethawed it, it died. Because, after all, it was just an experiment. <laughs> but I wasn't freezing a human being. I was freezing a, a plant. But the, the plant couldn't come back to life. I didn't know it because I was experimenting, but I accidentally killed the plant when I froze it. The point is that I had no power to resurrect the dead, to bring back even a green plant from death back into life. I couldn't do it. And transhumanism is the science that's very popular today which they're experimenting on all kinds of frontiers, like uh, not only freezing bodies and then bringing them back to life, uh, um, combining human bodies with computers, artificial intelligence, uh, human enhancement with, with super uh, drugs and all kinds of things. They want to uh, create artificial immortality for wealthy men and women. They're not telling you that. Your health care plan, believe me, is not going to pay for it. Neither will mine. But the super trillionaire class, believe me, they have access to all kinds of uh, medicines and scientific uh, treatments that, that you and I are not even aware of. And it, it goes under the general umbrella of transhumanism. But look, transhumanism is a counterfeit to the salvation offered to us in Jesus Christ. There's nothing wrong with eating healthy and nutrition and stuff. It may extend your life. It may give you a healthier life. It certainly, it certainly uh, is not bad for you, depending upon what you're taking, eating, etc. But the point is that we're under a curse. See, modern man, humanism, um, evolutionary theory, modern society, the educational system, they don't talk about death. They don't even, you know, you don't talk about mortality and death, hardly ever. It's socially unacceptable. It's, it's not good for ratings if you put it in TV shows and movies, generally speaking. So. Here, Adam and Eve are trying to save themselves by using fig leaves. It doesn't work. So God is teaching them that it's only through the blood of a, a living being like an animal that sins can be taken away, their sins.
But then God goes on as the Bible continues. God teaches the human race through the Jews primarily, initially, and then through the birth of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ came. God is, has been teaching mankind that the only way of salvation that works is through Jesus Christ. The only way that you can be saved from your sins, the only way that you can be delivered from death, the only way that you can receive eternal life and live forever in heaven with Jesus Christ and all those who have put their faith in Christ, the only way you can get into heaven is not through good works like the fig leaves were. The only way you can get into heaven is by putting your faith in the blood. It's the blood that that causes the remission of sins. But specifically, whose blood? Well, an animal blood is good for illustration or ceremonial purposes, but the animal blood will ultimately not cleanse you of sin. The only blood that will cleanse you right now of sin, and me right now of sin, the only blood that will cleanse us of sin is putting our faith and receiving the blood of Jesus Christ to personally cleanse us of all sin. It's when we appropriate by faith the blood of Jesus Christ and ask Jesus to forgive us of all of our sins through his blood, then after we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus of our sins by faith, we then by faith invite Jesus Christ into our lives and we ask him, to make us born again, which is only possible after you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ by faith. So when you're born again, which means you've also asked Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins and be cleansed by his blood, you have now become a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. You're born again. You are a new man or a new woman in Christ Jesus. And you have also, as part of that package, if you will, you have received by faith automatically when you were born again and had your sins forgiven by Jesus, you receive the gift of eternal life. So that when that day comes, either you'll be alive and walking around when Christ returns, or if you happen to live and then die here and during this earth, season, the moment you're absent from the body, you will be present with the Lord in heaven in your brand new glorified body where you will live for all eternity with Jesus Christ and every other person who has put their faith in Christ. In other words, faith in Christ transcends even the animal skins that acted as a temporary ceremonial covering for Adam and Eve. The real covering that we need from our nakedness is not the real covering from a physical nakedness. It's the real covering from a spiritual nakedness. Because spiritual nakedness reveals the fact that we did something that separated us from God. But once we're in Christ, this is very important, Once we're in Christ, there's nothing we can do that will separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. Does that mean we should go out and sin? No, of course not. But you can't, like, lose your temper one day and, uh, you know, lose your salvation. It just just doesn't happen that way. Okay, this is the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. And you can get a whole series of my books in in a book bundle discount. That means you save money now if you order now. And you can do that by going to paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. This is a great time to get some of the books you wanted to get. You can pre-order the brand new book, which I'm still finishing up, called Power From On High. I promise you that book will, will enable you to further understand or to receive power from on high. And that's something that God wants you to have in order to be victorious in the last days. This is the Paul McGuire Report. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. 
We'll be back in just a moment. Wherever you are on planet Earth, you are now listening to the Paul McGuire Report. This is Paul McGuire. Okay, God cleanses you of all of your sins if you come to him and ask for forgiveness. That is a liberating truth. That's one of the major reasons Christianity and the teachings of the Bible are so revolutionary and so radically different than Eastern mysticism, witchcraft, the occult, uh, meditation, yoga, uh, you know, astral projection, projection, the New Age. Biblical Christianity, the truth of Jesus Christ, is so awesomely more different than all these other religions and religious systems because the other religions and religious systems ultimately don't work any more than the fig leaves work for Adam and Eve. They don't work. Scientology, and I'm not a Scientologist. I'm not promoting Scientology, so don't get confused. But Scientology, a religion created by the science fiction author L. Ron Hubbard, they are... uh, very shrewd and strategic, and they have, they use an advertising, or they used to use an advertising type slogan to sell the religion of Scientology, and it was simply this quote: "Scientology works," and that's a good advertising slogan because, after all, what people want from a religion or a spiritual system, what they want is that it works. I mean. The reason people leave Christianity is they falsely think that Christianity doesn't work. Or like me, because I was raised in an atheistic household, I had an internal bias and an internal prejudice where I erroneously thought that Christianity couldn't possibly work. And that was based on my appraisal of the lives of so-called Christians I, I saw in the neighborhood. Now, they weren't born-again type Christians. They were just, you know, like denominational Christians. But the point is, I didn't see any evidence in the lives of these denominational Christians that Christianity works. So why would I want to be a Christian? I wouldn't be. And you say, well, what about the people who come from Christian homes and walk away from it? There's a difference from coming from a Christian home and walking away from it. and. what we would call denominational Christianity. In the the overwhelming majority of cases of people who were raised in Christian homes and then walked away from it, the problem that these individuals have ultimately is not so much with Jesus Christ. They're not really, in most cases, walking away from Jesus. What they're walking away from, once again, is this popular and very prevalent cultural interpretation of what Christianity is supposed to be. That's what these children from evangelical homes are walking away from. They're not walking away from Jesus. They're walking away from the way Jesus is being interpreted by the churches they went to or the way their parents practice Christianity or whatever. And, and that's a big difference. Now, before you go into an autopilot guilt trip and start hyper-shaming yourself because, well, maybe you raised a child to be a Christian and they are one of the people that have walked away from Christianity, the only thing I would say to you is two things. One, knowledge is power. You have to understand that your personal struggles, your personal spiritual battle, in terms of parenting, raising children, and trying to pass on the authentic biblical Christian faith uh, to try to pass it on to your children, your struggles, your successes, and yes, your failures in that area, you need to be set free from that. The only way you can process that information is to fully understand. That's what I explain in my books, and I explain it in The Greatest Battle 
of the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. Until you understand that your personal drama, so to speak, as a parent, a father or a mother, raising a child, a son or a daughter or whatever, who then walks away from Christ, it doesn't always boil down to, oh, you're such a hypocrite, or oh, if only you were a better Christian, or oh, if only you'd done this, or oh, if only you'd done that. No, the devil wants you stuck in that maze. The devil wants you to waste your life away in that maze of self-guilt, self-shaming, etc., etc. The truth will set you free. Your personal microcosmic spiritual battle of being a parent in this lifetime, the last 75 years, let's say, hypothetically, you have to understand, and this is what I point out in the book, that you and I and every man and woman alive, including those that come from Christian homes and those that don't, like me, we were all part of a targeted spiritual war initiated by a very wealthy and powerful globalist elite that targeted, in terms like of like a psychological warfare, they targeted Christianity for destruction. They did it through the Frankfurt School. They did it through the media. They did it through culture. They did it through sexuality. They've done it through many different battlefields. But they listed and itemized that their number one enemy, whether we're talking about the communists or Marxists or the Frankfurt School, social engineers or uh, radicals from different movements, philosophical movements like, and religious movements like the Illuminati, like the secret occult societies, they all came together to destroy Christianity. Their number one goal, according to, if you don't believe me, then read my books. I have a copy of the Illuminati Manifesto in my book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Read those books. You can see bullet point by bullet point what the Illuminati Manifesto is, and then you can contrast it with the bullet points of the Communist Manifesto that I also include in the book. And you can see they're practically one and the same. How is it that the Illuminati Manifesto is, the Communist Manifesto is like a mirror copy of the Illuminati Manifesto? How could that be? Well, you find out when you read the book, and I'm not trying to play games with you. It'll set you free. You see, your struggles have not been just your struggles. They've been amplified, agitated, inserted with various forms of psychological warfare. Your faith, your belief system as a Bible-believing Christian has been a target. It's been the object of a systematic, strategic attack that has been going on for decades. So the waves and riptides that occur in a household where children who have been raised in the faith, the Christian faith, are now veering off into witchcraft and all kinds of things, that is not just uh, a formula that includes you, your, your child, And then that's it. You need to to take it upon yourself to analyze the whole thing a little more deeply. You you weren't just doing your best struggling against the tide. No, your kid didn't walk away from Jesus because you got a divorce or you had an affair or an addiction problem or whatever. That may not have been the greatest thing for that to have happened, but that's not the bottom line reason. Your child may have walked away from the faith in Christ. The real reason is your children, and you and I to whatever degree, have been caught up in this vicious, unseen spiritual warfare that has used the media, uh, government, politics, culture, science, and so many other fields have been weaponized to destroy biblical Christianity and replace it with a pagan, Luciferian belief system. 
you don't believe it, you think that sounds too heavy. I'll give you a quick illustration. <clears throat> I don't know what age you are. I really don't care. Welcome to the program, no matter what age you are. Some of you were around when the Beatles made it big. Some of you were around like I was when the Beatles released their Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, which was really, at that time, a breakthrough rock and roll uh, album. But if you look on the album cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles, you see the faces of all of these famous people, like Marilyn Monroe and, you know, on and on and on. But if you look carefully, you also see, and all the faces on the album cover are about the same size, you see uh, a picture of Aldous Huxley on the album cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now, what was he doing on that? And then you see a picture of Aleister Crowley on the Beatles album. Aleister Crowley, as you know, is the great Satanist. 666, the the world's most famous Satanist in the last 400 years. So if you look carefully, you see that many of the people that the Beatles choose to promote and elevate were very dark and very evil people like Aleister Crowley, the great Satanist, and other people of that evil genre. Now, why would the Beatles be promoting people like Huxley and Aleister Crowley? Because they were the, the wolf, the wolf, you know, Jesus warns us and the Apostle Paul warns us about the wolf in sheep's clothing. The Beatles look like sheep. They look like you know, happy initially anyway, the mop top, they were relatively clean cut in their lyrics and stuff initially. But as time goes on, the real nature, the wolf-like nature of the Beatles is revealed. Their hair starts getting longer and longer. They're taking hardcore drugs like LSD. They're promoting sexual promiscuity. They're openly promoting Eastern mystical meditation, openly promoting Uh, promiscuous sexuality, openly promoting marijuana, openly promoting LSD usage. And now on their early, this is still in their early series of albums, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, they have the world's most famous Satanist, and then they have Huxley, the, the dark author of the scientific dictatorship on the cover. That's just a little clue. And it's hidden in plain sight. Anybody, well, I looked it up. I don't think most people look it up. I looked it up on a search engine. What are the names and faces of all the people on the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band album? Now, in my book, Power From High, I, I list it. But if you just want to look it up yourself, I mean, it's hidden in plain sight. There's you know, hundreds of websites that list the names and faces of all the people that were put on the cover of the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. What do you think that was all about? That was a that was a psyops operation, psychological operation, a psychological warfare operation. It was designed to ultimately take down Christian society, and they used a what appeared to be sheep, but they really were wolves in sheep's clothing. And that's part of the way they broke down Western biblical culture. And so your experiences as a parent, your experiences personally as a teenager, all fall into the invisible spiritual warfare that was raging when you were parenting, or maybe you're parenting now, was raging when you were a teenager and is raging now behind the scenes in our culture. And the way you win your children, the way you win your culture, the way you win your nation, is you have to understand that the primary battle, 
the primary spiritual battle, not the secondary, not the third, not the fourth tier of the spiritual battle, but the primary spiritual battle that we're involved in, that God has called us to be involved in, in a peaceful, law-abiding manner, is when we own through revelation of the Holy Spirit and by anchoring our belief system to the Word of God, when we own the words of the Apostle Paul, who says in Ephesians 6, For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the dark, unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. You see, when you own those Bible verses, which are the truth, then you own the reality that you and I are involved in a spiritual warfare with beings, fallen angels, of an entire hierarchy of different rankings. The high-level demons, the lower-level demons. We are in a in the, in the greatest battle. That's why I titled my book, Then You Need to Get It, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. We are fighting all these different levels of fallen angels and demonic powers. Now, you don't have to go crazy or out of balance with that truth, but that truth interfaces into the the more challenging areas of life. The spiritual battle interfaces into areas such as parenting, Marriage, divorce, remarriage, sexuality, human sexuality, art, culture, morals, an absolute right or an absolute wrong. The spiritual battle interfaces with all these areas which can be potentially great sources of blessing or potentially uh, great sources of spiritual warfare. That is why marriage itself is under and has been under the most intensive spiritual warfare, psychological warfare attack for at least, at minimum, the last 60 years. <clears throat> you say, Paul, what do you mean by that? Well, what I, what I mean by that is that Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, uh, the feminist movement, the 60s counterculture with the sexual revolution, they were all intended at the bottom line to shatter the, the biblical concept of a family and to promote free sex, uh, by free sex, destroy any boundary. Uh, destroy any concept of marriage, which is the communist Marxist ideal, by the way. Knowledge is power, and the truth shall set you free. You're listening to Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. We are able to be involved and equip people like you for the spiritual war that we're involved in now in the last days because we have intercessory prayer warriors like you that are going to battle for us on your knees. And I thank God for each and every one of you who are faithful to pray for me, my family, in this ministry. I thank God for each and every one of you who spread our messages far and wide. Thank you, in Jesus' name. And finally, no warfare, physical warfare or spiritual warfare, can be engaged in with the goal of victory unless it has sufficient finances. And we need the finances to expand our technology, to expand our outreach, to expand our technical quality. There's so many levels that we have to improve and upgrade in order to win the battle for the hearts and souls of mankind and win souls for Jesus Christ. So I want to thank each and every one of you who have gone to the Lord and simply prayed a straight from the heart prayer to Jesus and said, Jesus, what would you have me give Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church in terms of a financial contribution, donation, or one-time gift? What would you have me do, Lord? And then you're obedient to the Lord. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart, whatever the Lord tells you to do, you do that. And it's that way we can continue 
to run this ministry, win souls for Christ, and most importantly, make a difference for the kingdom of God. That's what, what This is what I live and breathe, and I know you do too, or you wouldn't be listening. You would not be listening except for the fact that you have a burden and a heart for souls. People who do not have a burden and a heart for souls and a love for God's word don't listen to the program. You know why? Because it drives them crazy. Well, you don't have to be driven crazy. The fun is on the side that we're on, the side of of life and the Holy Spirit and supernatural joy and the awesome, awesome thrill that happens when you walk in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. On that note, God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. Music